Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that uh, we're able to be here today, that we're able to hear you speak to us uh, through your word. And Father, as we think about this word now, please open our ears, our hearts, our minds, so that we might indeed understand what you are saying. Uh, Help me to explain it clearly and faithfully. And help us, Father, by your spirit to respond to this word in ways that are truly pleasing and honouring to you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Last week we started our journey through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And as we started that journey, we heard about what a genuine Christian looks like. Uh, We heard that a genuine Christian is a person of faith, uh, faith in Jesus to save them, uh, faith in Jesus as their king and ruler. Uh, We heard that a genuine Christian person is a person of love, love for God, but love for others, especially uh, those who are followers of Jesus. And a Christian person who is genuine in the faith is a person of hope. Uh, They are looking forward to the coming of Jesus. They are looking forward uh, to the life that is to come. Now, we heard last week, though, that uh, faith, love and hope are not just uh, things in the head or of the emotions. Uh, They are things which are actually expressed in the way that we live. So we heard that a person of faith does good works uh, in obedience to what it is that Jesus has commanded us to do. Uh, The person who genuinely loves others uh, demonstrates that by their labour, by their service and their care, even to the point of exhaustion uh, for the sake of others, for the betterment of others. And the person who has genuine hope, well, they show they have genuine hope by their willingness to live for Jesus no matter the cost no matter even if it means death, because they know that something better is to come. So that's what a genuine Christian looks like, 1 Thessalonians 1 tells us. Today, as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, we're going to hear about what genuine Christian ministry looks like, or genuine Christian service is another way of describing it. Now, friends, all of us, if we are genuine Christians, will be engaged in ministry we'll be engaged in service. Indeed, uh, the good works that we're called to do, the love that we're meant to labour in, uh, all points to the fact that we will be involved in service. It's not just uh, the minister of the church who does ministry. No, the job of the minister and leaders in churches is actually to equip all of God's people uh, for works of service. And so this morning, we're going to focus on what uh, 1, Timoth- uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 16 says about what genuine Christian service or ministry looks like so that we can make sure that in our efforts to minister, we are doing what we're meant to be doing. Now, it seems as you look at these verses that uh, maybe the Apostle Paul writes what he does about his ministry to the Thessalonians because there were some doubts that had arisen. Maybe some of the opponents of Paul had started to sort of poison the minds of the Thessalonians, uh, cause them to cast doubt on the way in which Paul had ministered among them. Uh, Maybe that's what's going on. But whatever the issue is, what we see here is that Paul gives an account of how he ministered to the Thessalonians. And what we see is that his ministry is a model that really we are all to follow. It is genuine Christian ministry, which we will do well to follow as we minister. Now, there are three main things that uh, Paul speaks about when it comes to genuine Christian ministry in this passage. And the first is this. The genuine Christian ministry involves gospel proclamation for the purpose of pleasing God. Uh, Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 2. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Uh, First of all, genuine Christian ministry involves the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, Friends, the goal of our service, of our ministry as followers of Jesus, is to help make disciples for Jesus, and to mature disciples in the faith. That's what we're on about. And so if you're going to help unbelievers to become believers, you need to share the gospel. If you're going to help uh, believers to keep remembering they need to keep trusting in Jesus and hoping in him, you need to share the gospel. Okay, so the gospel is at the heart of our ministry. Sharing the gospel is at the heart of what we are to do. Now notice that uh, the Apostle Paul shared the gospel 
in the face of strong opposition. When he was in Philippi, as he says, they were treated outrageously as they shared the gospel. He was jailed, he was flogged. And we heard last week that in Thessalonica, as Paul shared the gospel, that the Jews were very much uh, in opposition to him, so much so that they caused a riot, which resulted in Paul having to leave the city. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going for a job, I tend not to want to do something that's going to cause me pain or hostility or opposition. Indeed, I remember having a job um, after I'd finished my HSC. I was a bit short of money. Christmas was coming up. A friend of mine said, oh, why don't you come work at uh, where I work at a golf course and you can pick up balls from the driving range. I thought, that's great. I, I turned up for my first night of the job and uh, the guy chucks me this mattress with a hole in the middle of it. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, you've got to put your head through the hole and, and the sort of mattress goes on one side and on the other and it protects you as the balls are coming your way, as the people are hitting the golf balls. No one told me people would be hitting golf balls at me, you know. And, and I said, well, I probably need a helmet then. He said, yeah, here you are. And I said, there's no face mask on the helmet. He said, keep your head down. And, uh, and, and of course, human nature being what it is, as I was out there picking up the golf balls, guess what the people up there were doing? Oh, there's someone to aim for. I only did it that one night. That was it. We don't tend to do things that cause pain, do we? Right? Why does the Apostle Paul preach the gospel? When he is treated outrageously in Philippi, when there is a riot uh, that occurs in Thessalonica, why does he preach the gospel when this suffering and this opposition comes his way? Well, it's because of what motivates him. And this brings us to verses 3 to 4. We read, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. See the motivation? As those approved by God, entrusted with the gospel by God, Paul and his workers now strive to please God who has called them, not to please people. Uh, if you're a people pleaser, you probably won't share the gospel because many people won't be pleased to hear the gospel as you share it. Indeed, in our culture, we have the saying, there are two things that you don't talk about at dinner parties, politics and religion. Okay, And, and so we can kind of uh, be quiet not say anything about Jesus. Why? Because we're worried that if we say something that will offend people, people will not be pleased with us. And so people pleasing results in us being silent about the gospel. Well, Paul knew that he'd been entrusted by God with the gospel. At, he knew that he existed for God. And so he knew that in all that he was to do, he was to please God. Not worry about what others thought but to please God. Let me ask you, are you a people pleaser or a God pleaser? Our willingness to share the gospel strongly indicates, I think, which one we possibly are. People pleaser, God pleaser. Paul was very much a people pleaser and those engaged in genuine Christian ministry will proclaim the gospel because they're devoted to pleasing God rather than people. They're also devoted to pleasing God instead of pleasing themselves. Uh, indeed, in verses 5 to 7a, the Apostle Paul goes on, you know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Uh, it seems that the Apostle Paul here is comparing himself to different uh, teachers and philosophers who would wander their way around Macedonia and Achaia and places like that, uh, coming into a city and saying, come hear me, uh, you very good looking people. Uh, I have uh, words of wisdom to share and it's going to make a big difference to your life and only cost you $100 to come and hear me say these things. And so, so that was the kind of the thing that was going on back in that time. We see it happen today too, don't we? Uh, people use flattery, charge money. Indeed, people who are focused on pleasing themselves uh, will often be in things for profit, uh, for praise, or for power. 
If people are seeking to please themselves, uh, they will often do things so that they will profit, so that they will receive praise, or that they might have power. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, well, we didn't flatter you in order to uh, try and profit from you. Uh, we weren't there so that you would praise us. We we're actually trying to get you to praise God. And uh, we certainly didn't sort of, uh, you know, uh, try and have a situation where we had power over you, even though as apostles of Christ, we have authority. No, no, no. What does Paul say? We're like children. We're humble in your midst. Let me ask you, are you a God pleaser or a self pleaser? Self pleasers are in it for the profit, for the praise, for the power. It's very easy to be a people pleaser or a self pleaser, isn't it? Uh, very easy to please those that we can see, either in front of us or in the mirror, rather than the one that we cannot see. But the truth of the matter is that genuine gospel ministry at its heart is motivated by a desire to please God. And as Kathy uh, mentioned this morning in the kids' spot, God has entrusted us with his gospel to go and make it known to others so that people who are not yet disciples of Jesus can become disciples so that those who are disciples can grow. He's entrusted the gospel to us for that task. And as those who have been set apart by God through Jesus, we are to be seeking to please him and to please him by praising him as we share the gospel. Are you a God pleaser, a people pleaser, or a self pleaser? Genuine Christian ministry comes from the motivation of pleasing God, not people or ourselves. Now, the second main thing that Paul says about what genuine Christian ministry looks like is this. Genuine Christian ministry involves loving people. Verses 7b to 8, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Uh, some of you might have been wondering today, Mark, why aren't you talking about mothers, given it's Mother's Day? Well, there it is in verse 7. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about mothers. Uh, he actually talks about how his ministry is one where he loves uh, those that he was ministering to, just as a mother cares for her young child. Uh, indeed, notice that the Apostle Paul makes it clear that uh, his ministry, that genuine Christian ministry, is not just about sharing a message, it's also about sharing our lives with those that we are ministering to. Okay? It's all about loving those that we are ministering to. Uh, those that uh, we are ministering to are not just targets so we could say, okay, I've preached the gospel to them, tick, uh, move on to the next one. No, no, this is meant to be an investment of ourselves in the lives of others that we are ministering to with the gospel. It's not just about sharing a message, it's sharing our lives as well. And in the verses that follow, the Apostle Paul gives some practical examples of how he had uh, strived to love uh, the Thessalonians while he was with them. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So notice, first of all, in verse 9, uh, a key way in which the Apostle Paul and his workers loved uh, the Thessalonians was by not charging them, but by actually working hard, and in Paul's case as a tent maker, uh, labouring very, very hard so that these people could hear the gospel for free. That was one of the key ways in which he loved them. Uh, remember that uh, genuine love results in labour. And here was Paul labouring through his tent-making work uh, as a, a way of loving these Thessalonians so they could hear the gospel for free. Uh, notice that Paul speaks about uh, how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. Um, friends, if you love people, you're always committed to doing what is right by them. 
not acting corruptly against them or in an underhanded way or whatever. You are always committed to doing what is best, what is right for a person. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, have a look at the way in which I acted amongst you. Can, can you say that I was underhanded in any way? Can you say that I was corrupt in any way? Can you say I was misleading in any way? No, says Paul, because we were committed to living the righteous life. Remember, the person of faith does good works. Okay, They strive to live in obedience to the kind of life that Jesus would have us live. And then notice he talks about how he dealt with them as a father, deals with children. We've got the whole family in this passage, haven't we? Paul says, I was like a child, you know, humble, like a mother, caring, like a father. Fathers in the culture of this time were really responsible for teaching their children about morals, instructing them about the right way to live. And Paul says, we were certainly teaching you the right way to live. But notice the, the way in which he talks about it, we encouraged you. So when you were fearful, we were striving to give you courage, uh, comforting. So when things weren't going so well, we were there alongside you to comfort you. So again, it wasn't just a sort of a, um, you know, a, a clinical lecture or teaching or whatever. It was very much done in such a way uh, to be of benefit for those who were actually sitting under Paul and listening to him. He was teaching in a loving way. Okay? So, genuine Christian ministry involves loving people, sharing our lives with people, investing in people, caring for people, working hard for people, labouring for people to the point of exhaustion, comforting people, encouraging people. It's not just a cold clinical delivery of a message. Okay? So, genuine Christian ministry involves preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, to please God. It involves not just sharing the gospel, but our lives as well, loving people deeply. Thirdly, God works through genuine Christian ministry to transform people. Uh, have a look at uh, verses 13 to 15a. And we thank God also continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things. Those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. Uh, notice Paul highlights that the gospel that they preached was the word of God. He uh, highlights to these uh, people, the way in which the word of God was at work in them who believed. Uh, the idea here is, is that, remember last week we heard these uh, Thessalonians had been people worshipping idols, serving, worshipping idols. And as a result of hearing the gospel, they stopped serving and worshipping idols. They repented and then they, they now started to serve and to worship God. A massive change had been wrought in their life because of the word of God at work in them. And they were committed to serving and worshipping God despite the opposition that they faced. Indeed, the Apostle Paul speaks about that the word of God worked so powerfully in the Thessalonians that they were really like the churches in Judea and Israel who had been changed by the word of God and who served God despite suffering. Transformation had occurred as a result of this genuine Christian ministry where the Apostle Paul shared the gospel and loved these people. Transformation had occurred. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, if, if you want to see people changed, transformed, uh, to be more and more like Jesus, it happens through the ministry of the Word of God. It doesn't happen through our philosophies or our own amazing ideas. That's why the gospel is so crucial. Okay? If you're not sharing the gospel faithfully, don't expect to see transformation. But here's the thing. If your ministry is a genuine ministry and you are sharing the gospel, not everyone you share the gospel with will be transformed. Okay? Not everyone you share the gospel with will be transformed. Uh, indeed, verses 15b to 16, we read, They, the Jews, displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. 
The Apostle Paul preached the gospel and yes, a number of people were transformed by it. But lots of people opposed him. Lots of people opposed him. And that should come as no surprise because Paul is serving the crucified one, the one who was opposed and put to death on a cross. Uh, The Apostle Paul made it very clear, if anyone wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will be persecuted. The Lord Jesus made it clear that if they persecute me, your master, they'll persecute those who serve the master. The fact that people refuse to heed the gospel, the fact that people are not transformed by the gospel doesn't suggest that our ministry is somehow not genuine. Genuine Christian ministry is a must if you want to see people transformed. But the fact that people reject what we preach is not a sign that our ministry is not genuine. Does that make sense? So so don't think, oh, gee, we only have, you know, 50, 60 people at church, you know, and church down the road has got 700. Oh, maybe there's something not genuine about us. No, let me tell you, there are plenty of big churches around that don't preach the gospel. But are people pleasing? Okay? It's not by numbers of converts that we judge whether a ministry is genuine. If a ministry is genuine, people will be transformed. But some will oppose. But ultimately, a ministry is genuine if the gospel is being proclaimed because of a desire to please God and if those that we're ministering to are being loved. That's what genuine Christian ministry looks like. And so let me ask you, are you engaged in genuine Christian ministry? Because it's not just me who's meant to be engaged in ministry, we all are. Okay? Being a disciple of Jesus means serving, ministry. Are we sharing the gospel with others out of a desire to please God? Or are we people pleasers or self pleasers? Uh, as we engage in ministry, are we loving those that we're ministering to, sharing our lives with them, caring for them deeply, labouring for them, uh, encouraging them, comforting them? You see, that's what genuine Christian ministry looks like. Let me pray now that we might indeed uh, be ministering in that genuine way and that God. Um, out of his mercy, would work through us to transform people. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, for your word, and we thank you for the model that we see in 1 Thessalonians 2 of what genuine Christian ministry looks like. Um, Father God, we pray, please help us as your people to be committed to sharing your gospel out of a desire to please you. Uh, Father, if we are people-pleasing or self-pleasing, please help make that evident to us so that we can repent of that and please you and you alone. Father God, help us to follow the example of Jesus uh, by loving those that we minister to, by being willing to labour for them, to care deeply for them, uh, to encourage and comfort them. And Lord God, we ask in your mercy that you would work through us to transform people. Help us, Father, as we hold your word out uh, to so impact people by the work of your spirit that people would stop uh, worshipping things that are not you and indeed worship you wholeheartedly and live for you and serve you. And we want to pray for these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.